Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is the last lesson in a fantastic series on the Book of Romans. It's entitled Salvation by Faith Alone, the Book of Romans. And this particular lesson will cover Romans 14 through 16. And it's entitled, the lesson is entitled Christian Living. So I hope that you have your Bibles in front of you. Uh, we'll be looking at several passages, including some over in 1 Corinthians, so, uh, but all within a few pages of each other. So we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the ways in which you have worked with prophets of old and apostles in the New Testament, and particularly in this lesson, the way you worked with your friend Paul. We look forward to the day when we might meet him in the heavenly kingdom and ask him why he wrote some things in the way he did and what were the circumstances under which he wrote, questions we wish we knew the answers to now. But we can read a lot into what we've already have in our hands and so we ask you to guide us in our discussion today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 14 deals with the question of what is acceptable practice for a believing Christian. Now that can take several directions as we'll see in our discussion. The particular question being discussed was food offered to idols. Now we don't deal with that so much in our day. Uh, have any of you had trouble with eating food offered to idols? I don't think so. There are several very significant issues involved, however, if you read behind the lines. Do we need to judge others to set them straight? That would be the first question. Well, these verses, the first few verses of uh, Romans 14, have raised a great deal of consternation among conservative Christians, among Seventh-day Adventists, and I think you'll figure out why when I read them to you. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. So immediately, a lot of people reading superficially jump on this, say this must be a discussion of vegetarianism. Not quite sure what it has to do with faith, I'm not quite sure what it has to do with idols, but there it says vegetables, right? Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't, while those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who will eat anything, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? And of course, what's he implying by that? All Christians are the servants of what? Servants of God. Servants of God. It is their own master, and notice the capital M, who will decide whether they succeed or fail. And they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. And then you should not stop there, even though there's a paragraph break. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days, while others think that all days are the same. We should each firmly make up our own minds. So you can worship on Tuesday. What day do you want to worship on? Wednesday, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what we're supposed to get from this passage? No. No. Okay, well. Why not? And why not? <laughs> a lot of people have looked at that passage and say this is a clear indication. They put that together with 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 4, and they put it together with other verses and just say it's very clear that... Um, you know, all you people with your strict codes of eating and your worshiping on a certain day of the week, that's all gone. Christians don't need to worry about that stuff anymore. Well, we need to understand that Paul was writing from either Corinth or Sincrea, which was just a little ways outside of Corinth, like, kind of like a suburb. In Corinth, almost all of the roads entering the city had pagan temples on them. And you can still visit Corinth. There very working very vigorously to restore it as far as possible to the glory it once exhibited in the days of Paul. Um, very interesting to visit Corinth. But there you can see temples for this, temples for that, temples for all kinds of stuff. There were a whole bunch of them there. It was expected that the one was to bring flesh food or alcohol into the city for sale. He would stop at one of those pagan temples and offer a portion of the commodity as an offering to the idol, thus dedicating all of it to that idol. Yeah, 
why why the wine and the and the meat okay well there are various possible reasons the main reason is probably just economics those are the things that sold for the most money and you can make the most money out of it and so give offering it a portion of it to uh, the idol was a recognition that okay um, nobody bothered to offer vegetables to the idols I mean who's gonna pay a lot of money for vegetables so the highest price per pound was the meat and the alcohol yeah so that was that's probably the real reason behind the scene I'm sure there was other people would say well but these are the real important food so that's the ones we offered to the idol and there were probably other reasons maybe the priests had uh, a yen for those things and encouraged also their... very very likely they very likely yeah so the question then becomes if you go to the market and you buy either alcohol or or meat and we'll be mainly focusing on the meat and you take it home and you cook it are you worshiping that idol, whichever idol it was, to which that meat was dedicated. And of course, the additional thing that we sometimes overlook is the fact that, and that's brought out in a passage we'll look at in a little bit, a little bit later. These people got a lot more meat and wine than they could consume. The people ran the temples a lot more meat, meat and wine than they could consume themselves. So what do you do? You establish. A restaurant out behind the temple and you serve this meat and wine that you've been given free to dedicate dedicated to the God and now you are offering a special service to the community and the question then becomes okay maybe you don't believe this idol is important but is it all right for you to eat in the restaurant behind the temple and eat some of the food that has been clearly dedicated to the idol Okay, would it be acceptable for a Christian to eat a meal in such a restaurant, even if you don't eat the meat and the wine? And what did the Christians in Corinth think about that practice? Did they think it was fine for a person to eat in one of those restaurants? Did some of them say yes and some of them said no? Well, we obviously have two primary groups of people that are struggling with this question. There are those who used to be pagans and now become Christians and still wonder in their minds whether those pagan idols might have impacted the food in some way or another. And then there were those former Jewish Christians who said, those idols don't mount anything at all. They're nothing but chunks of wood and metal and stone or whatever they're made out of. So they can't affect the food in any way. So fine, help yourself. If it's, if it's a food that's fit to eat, whether it's been offered to the idol or not, makes no difference at all. Would they have been concerned, the Jewish believers, would they have been concerned about, well, the Jews, uh, uh, a Jew, would they be concerned about the fact that it probably wasn't kosher? Yes. That was that's an that additional would be more of a, an issue with uh, with the Jews. Of course, not with uh, the others. They wouldn't. Yeah. That wouldn't be part of their their thinking or their yeah. inhibitions or their makeup. Exactly. So that's another factor which Paul doesn't really discuss, but it's another thing to put in the in the hopper in the discussion. It's well, kind of hard though to figure out what was in their minds when you eat that food. I mean, well, that's the you, question. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell because we just look at it as a ceremonial thing. We don't want anything to do with the ceremony, so we don't eat. But maybe they people thought that when you offer food to idols, that something happens to it to make it even better for you. And well, so, some of them probably did. And so, you know, they would eat it with glee because they're eating this this supercharged food. So if a Christian goes in and eats the food, well, they might, they might get the wrong impression that they're believing in that power. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things that could have happened. They we just don't understand it. Yeah, they could have had, you know, the heathen eating the, the meat that had been offered to idols may have had some ritual about that that impacted their thinking. And so to go back in there and, and do that and try to keep the idol thought out of their head 
might be a, a struggle. Okay. Well, or the, the the proximity, you know, yeah. it's right next to the temple. Yeah. Uh, temptation to to get involved with what, what whatever was going on there. Yes. Well, there's an additional complication that's found in Acts 15, verses 28 and 29. And may I read it from my Good News Bible. This is, remember that Paul had gone down with Barnabas and Silas and some others from Antioch when the brethren in, in Jerusalem came very concerned about how all these Gentiles were becoming Christians and maybe it's not safe, you know, to have so many Gentiles in the church. And the Jews were particularly concerned. They wanted, they wanted Christianity to be a subset of Judaism. You have to be a Jew first and then you can become a Christian. That's what they wanted. But Paul said, nothing doing. The Gentiles can come in on their own terms. They don't have to be Jews first. They don't have to be circumcised, all that kind of stuff. And after a long discussion involving Peter and James, the, the, the brother of Jesus and so forth, they concluded these words. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. So you're going to tell me why they're necessary. Eat, number one, eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled. Well, that's another version of eating animals that, eating the blood, basically. And keep yourself from sexual immorality. Now we can understand why they would say that. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. Okay, so Paul is there. The meeting is held. They agree. They say the Holy Spirit has agreed with us with this conclusion. Now, Paul arrives in Corinth, and he's been there for some time, and he works there for a year and a half, and as you remember, he traveled back to Jerusalem, and then he came back to Antioch and Jerusalem probably, and then he came back, he'd agreed to come back and work in Ephesus, so he worked in Ephesus for about three years, and then things got really hot there. The, the silversmith said, this Paul is destroying our work here. And so Paul had to escape from Ephesus, basically. He traveled around to Corinth after having written him a couple, two or three letters. And now he's back in Corinth and he's sitting down and he's writing the books of Galatians and Romans. So since Paul was in Corinth dealing with mostly Gentile believers there and writing a book to the Roman, remember when Paul, when Paul first came to Corinth, what did God say to him? What, what did Paul think, first of all, and then what did God say to him? Paul thought there's nothing to do here. Yeah, this, this city is so wicked, I'm not sure there's any reason for me to stay here. And God said what? Stay. Stay. Yes. Stay a year and a half. There's a lot of people here who need to hear the gospel. So, bearing that in mind, Paul is now writing to the Romans. Has he been to Rome before? No. No, no never been to Rome. He knows, apparently knows some people over there by name because we, we have their names in, in chapter 16. Probably people, for whatever reason, who'd moved there. Maybe he'd met somewhere anyway. He's writing this book to the Roman believers who are also largely Gentiles. Was he free to ignore the advice given at the Jerusalem Council even though the decisions of that conference were inspired by the Holy Spirit? And even well, though Paul had been a participant in that meeting yes. and agreed to this, to these rules. Okay. But, but you didn't answer the question, uh, what made these rules necessary? Were they concerned yeah. about ritual impurity or in any way, or were they more concerned with keeping these uh, new believers away from uh, the temple uh, influences at, uh, in the which they would have to do in order to be involved okay. with those, those things. Mm -hmm. the, the meat offered to idols. Mm -hmm. the, the so you're, you're thinking the, the reason for not, uh, not, but what would that have to do with eating blood? What does that have to do with well, that's eating where animals would, that are strangled? Those, that's where they would get those things because they, uh, yeah. you know, where, where else would they? Well, I suppose they could probably get them somewhere else, but, uh, and they could have uh, be involved with sexual sexual immorality somewhere else too. But all of these things sort of cluster somewhat around idol worship. And, 
mm -hmm. the temple. So I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that the Jerusalem Council is trying to protect them from getting into situations over their head, and uh, and that's what Paul is doing in in Cor uh, Corinth too. In okay. His Let's see if we can get any anybody else want to throw their two bits in. Okay, Paul was clearly overriding the decision made by the General Conference in Jerusalem and recognized that the cultural situation he was dealing with required a different approach, for whatever reason. Uh, whether it's because he wants to keep them away from those pagan temples, which was, it'll be a little hard to do because the, the, if you're living in Corinth, the city is just full of them. Um, Paul was suggesting that what matters is not so much the eating of the meat, which may have been offered to an idol, but how one relates to other members of the Christian church. Now, remember that the original reason that this discussion came up and the reason for the Jerusalem Council was what was going on in Antioch. Do we have any hint that um, they were involved in pagan temples or anything in Antioch? Now, there were pagan temples in Antioch, let's not question that, but there's nothing. The, only, the, the thing that seemed to be a problem was that the weather, and remember the Pharisees, I guess we, we should go back there to look at Acts 15 and, and look at this part of it. The first few, first five verses, some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. So what is their emphasis? Becoming a Jew. You, be a, you need to be a fully converted Jew, then you can become a Christian. Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this, so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. So the question was whether or not you had to follow all the Jewish regulations before you could become a Christian. They were sent on their way by the church, and as they went to Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God. This news brought great joy to all the believers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church. Remember, the church is still, the church is, in Jerusalem is still under terrible persecution. Let's remember that as, as all this is taking place. The apostles and the elders to whom they told all that, uh, that God had done through them. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So what was that original discussion all about? It sounds law like... Law of Moses and uh, particularly circumcision. Yeah, okay. Um, so some would, so it, and so Paul says, okay, is he still concerned about the law of Moses. Well, in order to understand what's going on here, we need to look at a few other places where Paul talks to the, the believers in Corinth. So, Gary, can you take on that first paragraph for us? And let, we're going to go around the table here and look at 1 Corinthians 8 and then a last part of 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Now concerning what you wrote about about food offered to idols. It is true, of course, that all of us have knowledge, as they say. Such knowledge, however, puffs a person up with pride, but, but love builds up. Those who think they know something really don't know as they ought to know. But the person who loves God is known by him. And Carrie? So then, about eating the food offered to idols, we know that an idol stands for something that does not really exist. We know that there is only the one God. Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and even though there are many of these gods and lords, Yet there's for us only one God, the Father, who is the creator of all things and for whom we live. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through him we live. But and not everyone knows this truth. Some people have been so used to idols that this day uh, that to this day they eat such food and they still think 
of it as food that belongs to an idol. Their conscience is weak and they feel they are defiled by the food. Food, however, is not I will, not. will not improve our relation with God. We shall not lose anything if we do not eat, nor shall we gain anything if we do not eat. If we do eat. Okay. I'm sorry. Fred? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Dennis? Yeah. I was waiting for you to... <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Be careful, however, not to let your freedom of action take those who are weak in the faith uh, to let your freedom of action make those who are weak in the faith fall into sin. Suppose a person whose conscience is weak in this matter sees you, who have so-called knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol. Will not this encourage him to eat food offered to idols? And so this weak person, your brother for whom Christ died, will perish because of your knowledge. And in this way, we will be sinning against Christ by sinning against your Christian brothers and sisters and wounding their weak conscience. So then, if food makes my brother or sister sin, I will never eat meat again, so as not to make my brother or sister fall into sin. Okay, let's stop there for a second. So what's the, what's the scenario that Paul's suggesting here? There are people who are weak, and we need to protect them. Okay. So, who, who are the weak people? Those who, uh, when they eat, if they were to eat meat offered to idols, would be drawn away from Christ. It would sear their conscience because they, they, they feel that they, well, I, I can't speak for that, but. <laughs> okay, well. They, it, they would draw them away. Okay. Perhaps early or young Christians that haven't thought in depth about this, which most of us probably haven't. Yeah. So it, it's probably not the church leaders, but the followers in the church who think that, who have been told, you can't eat meat that's offered to idols, you can't uh, eat meat that has blood, you can't eat meat that's been strangled. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're going to follow the rules. So. Here would be the situation. Presumably, they all would have heard about the Jerusalem conference, because that was, was supposed. That news was supposed to spread to all the churches. That's the way it was. That's the way it was announced. The way it was supposed to go. And all of a sudden, you're one of those new believers. You become a new. You're a new Christian, and you're trying carefully to follow all the rules. And you walk past one of these temples, one of these restaurants that's behind a pagan temple, and there's the church elder, enjoying his meal. And you're going to say, what? <gasps> Pastor, what are you doing? <laughs> it would confuse people that weren't very far into the truth yet. Mm -hmm. What if they were eating vegetables? Well, I mean, that would be obviously enough. You, oh, okay, you're eating only vegetables. I guess that's so okay. So they're going to come in and, and be the food police and make sure that they're <laughs> well, eating Well, so that's, that's, the what the, that's what we're talking about here. Are we authorized to be food police or not? No. We're to live at peace with all our brothers and sisters and encourage them. We are supposed to be consistent, though, and maybe a new person wouldn't see consistency if they saw somebody eating meat in one of those restaurants. And they would, because they haven't had time to think about it or have it explained to them. Well, one thing we, we should mention, uh, in the King James Version, if you love your King James as many of us do, but uh, it, 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 in the traditional English, meat can mean either food, just a broad term for all, any kind of food, or it can mean meat as in flesh, as we would use it in our day. Well, here it's specifically talking about flesh meat. It's not talking about just general food. When and these passages in Greek. Because that general food wasn't offered to the idols, was yeah, it? general food wasn't offered to the idols, that's correct. Idols weren't vegetarians or yeah. vegans. <laughs> okay, Gordon, what, can you take us to 1 Corinthians 10, starting with verse 23? Yes. We are allowed to do anything, so they say. That is true, but not everything is good. We are allowed to do anything, but not everything is helpful. 
None of you should be looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. You are free to eat anything sold in the meat market without asking any questions because of your conscience. For the scripture says, the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. Whoa! You're allowed to eat anything sold in the meat market? That's what it says. What would the Pharisees back in Jerusalem say? The heresy. Christi the Christian Pharisees. Heresy. Stroke. heresy. <laughs> well, there'd, there'd probably be liver there, and I can't stand liver. I'd never <laughs> eat it. And even though I'm free to, I'd never eat it. Okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's because I think he, he, of your scientific knowledge. Yeah, he's <laughs> emphasizing the, the freedom. I yes, it. you it could. Mm -hmm. But he's going to come around and say, no, we're not going to do that. Okay. So Jim's going to help us with that. <laughs> if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you decide to go, eat what is set before you without asking any question because of your conscience. Now we want to make it very clear here. This is not an issue about what's healthy or what's not healthy. This is a question of what you are comfortable eating. Okay. But if someone says to you, this food was offered to idols, then do not eat that food for the sake of the one who told you and for the conscience sake that is not your own conscience but the other person's conscience. Well then, someone says, why should we be, f why should my freedom be to act, excuse me, why should my freedom to act be limited by another person's conscience? If I stand, excuse me, if I thank God for my food, why should anyone criticize me about food for which I gave thanks? Sally? Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to God for God's glory. Live in such a way as to cause no trouble either to Jews or Gentiles or the Church of God. Just do as I do. I try to please everyone in all that I do, not thinking of my own good, but of the good of all, so that they might be saved. Imitate me, then, just as I imitate Christ. Well, it's interesting to compare Paul's approach in this setting to that of Daniel, as recorded in Daniel 1. What's the story of Daniel? Daniel said, no, I'm not going to eat the king's meat, right? The king's food. Why did he not eat the king's food? For the idols. Well, two reasons. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't healthy, but it was also uh, offered to idols. Well, now, Is there any place in the Levitical Code where it references meat offered to idols? Or is um, that more an issue for the Gentiles down in the New Testament, Testament era? That would, be, that would be fair to ask. Uh, and and I, I don't know, first comes up in my mind immediately. But that's something we need to think about. Because I'm thinking of Daniel uh, not wanting to, you know, obviously it wouldn't be kosher and it may not have been clean. So mm -hmm. his, in, in his uh, yeah. tradition, his thinking, this, this is not what God would have of, uh, of me. Well, the interesting thing about that is look at Daniel 10, verses 2 and 3. Paul, Daniel, Daniel 10, verses 2 and 3. Daniel has been very concerned about the mes messages he's gotten from the Holy Spirit and he's almost gotten sick because he's worried. And so he says, at that time I was mourning for three weeks. I did not eat any rich food or any meat, drink any wine or comb my hair until the three weeks were passed. What does that imply? That he did all those things at other times. Oh boy. Now we're doubling down on things. We're making this thing a real problem, aren't we? Yeah, but the wine was non-alcoholic. Well, it probably was. I mean, the <laughs> wine, wine he drank was probably almost certainly non-alcoholic, but... He would have had control over what kind of food, you know. He yeah, certainly. Prepared specially. Uh, another translation of the morning is uh, afflicting one's soul. Mm -hmm. which was something one did on the Day of Atonement, and that was the day of fasting. Of course, you're yeah. not going to fast for three weeks. Yeah. So it talks about restricting food and, and uh, things during that time. It's a type of fast. Okay, so what we see here is that by refusing to eat the king's food, Daniel and his friends were rejecting the Babylonian gods. After three years, they were better looking, healthier, and smarter than any of the others. Of course, 
we would say that had to do with the healthy version of their diet, uh, but it also meant that they were not involved in worshiping these other gods. Now, wasn't it even after 10 days that they, there was a trial? They, they were looking a little bit better, but the 10 times better was after three years. In Romans, Paul was speaking to believers in Rome, saying that those were, who were strong in their faith could eat whatever was sold in the market without asking any questions with regard to conscience. That was not a discussion about what was healthy. In Paul's day, he believed that taking this approach was saying that by eating the meat, one rejected the idols because he did not believe that offering the food to them affected the food in any way. Thus, Daniel and Paul did opposite things, but for the same reason, to reject idols. Mm. What do you think Paul and Daniel will have to say to each other in heaven? Yeah. Okay. Comments? You were wrong, Daniel. <laughs> no, I, I, oh. think, I think Paul and Daniel wouldn't have any problem agreeing with each other. They both said, you rejected the idols? Yeah, so did I. Well, the situation was different between the times. Oh dear! When you think you mean this is situation ethics? No, <laughs> that's a well, that's Daniel a bad was, word, isn't it? Daniel Daniel was was a Jew. Well, they're both Jews, yeah. but uh, Paul is transi transitioning into no longer being circumcised mm -hmm. and, and uh, requiring circumcision, as well as many of the other uh, Levitical codes and such. So, okay, they're they're. Yeah, there's a different situation, but it's what God is leading them to do at that time. And wouldn't we wouldn't we all agree that rejecting idols is what God always wants them to do? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I think that that's a fair conclusion. Well, Paul was saying that we need to keep in mind the judgment day. That day is much closer now than it was in the days of Paul and Ellen White said. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth, now we've, we, we've gotten into a, some, some sort of touchy areas, some difficult, challenging areas of interpretation. So there are many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth, know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others, I wonder who that would be, who will find upon examination, exa I'm sorry, find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Do you think Paul had a very good reason for what he said? Daniel had a very good reason for what he said? Until, this, until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. And there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they accept, have accepted as truth. Certain it is that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human in place of divine wisdom. Whew. Testimonies, volume page, page, volume five, page 707. That's kind of scary. Yeah, I remember reading uh, something about in the early days uh, where people kept coming to her and James and asking for, but what should we do, what should we do? And she wanted none of that. You know, you need to be able to go to the scriptures and, and come to conclusions, you know, yourself. You know, each one of us needs to have a, a, that connection with God so that he can guide us individually, not just through some great yeah. leader. Now, we, we have discussed this before, but it's quite likely that Paul, as a shining star for the Sanhedrin and in his early days, had memorized much of the Old Testament, probably including the book of Daniel. So, did that raise any questions in Paul's mind when he made this statement? About? About food offered to idols and what you can eat and what you can't eat? Was Paul convinced that his gospel was the truth? Absolutely, yes. How do you know that? If an angel should come with any truth other than what I've told you, don't believe it, he said. May he be, be condemned to hell. 
Uh -huh. Galatians 1, yeah. 6 to 9. So some of our Christian friends we know have used Romans 14 along with 1 Corinthians 10, 25, which we read a moment ago, Mark 7, 18 and 19, and 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, to suggest that the Seventh-day Adventist emphasis on a healthy diet is no longer required by God. So how, how are we supposed to interpret those verses? Well, no longer required by God to do what is the question. Mm -hmm. Right, where, uh, as was read, uh, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you should be able to do it all to the glory of God. You know? Okay. So if... Well, not only that, but what if you were really hungry and there was some food there and, and you couldn't touch it because of some ceremonial reason? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about David. He he ate food that wasn't he wasn't supposed to eat. That's right. And um, so we got to have the freedom to be able to to. I mean, why why would our faith just cause that kind of trouble? Well, uh, the question is, how much is there? I mean, where does your, your, how far does our freedom extend? You know, there, there's an old adage that says. Your freedom ends where my nose begins. Um, yeah, but we're not punching anybody's no, nose. I no. just want to fill up my stomach yeah, so I yeah. don't faint in the middle of the road there. So we would say that if the only reason you're avoiding certain foods is for ceremonial reasons, then perhaps these verses do apply to you. Idols do not have the power to hex food. Does one become ceremonial unclean by touching or eating such foods? Now remember, um, we know that the, the, the traditional Jewish belief in the New Testament is you would not dare even to enter the home of a Gentile. Now they are being asked not only to enter the home of a Gentile, but to sit down with them and worship with them in their homes. Peter did that. Peter did that very reluctantly. Well, according to <laughs> well. Well, that's that he, that he fully accepted Back. it and, and repeated the experience and why God had accepted those people. Yeah, well, that was good until he got to Antioch where he right. backed off again. Right. Yeah. But well. before they came, he was okay with uh, eating with the Gentiles. Okay. Well, it, you could relate to this if you were an Adventist and you okay. came into a, a newly converted person and you go in the house and the house smells like smoke and they're frying up something on the skillet and they said come on let's eat you know and um, so what would you do in that case well Gordon told you what to do in that case first Corinthians 10 25 eat whatever's but for you unless they say it's been offered to idols and somebody okay. else has told you that it was offered to idols. But that mm -hmm. doesn't hurt Adonis now, but the smell of smoke does, and the, and the uh, well, those greasy are, smell all over the yeah. place, maybe some smoke coming around from the skillet. Setting and, off the fire alarm. Yeah, and that kind <laughs> of stuff, and you go, oh my, what am I doing here, you know? But well, is there really something really scary in that? I mean, you're not going to be there forever. No. I can remember working in a not a Adventist hospital where everybody was still smoking. This is years mm -hmm. ago, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course, it, you you just accepted it as the way it is. Now today, oh, maybe we're in Montana. We're, you know, when I was a kid, every restaurant just reeked with smoke. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's no. it's changed now, but man, back then, it's, it's very whew. interesting that the huge committee of the, I don't even know what official group or whatever did this, but the past, the original CDC regulation on smoking, they have a picture of this room and you could hardly see anybody. It was so full of cigarette smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that we're dealing with a health issue though. No. Here. Those who are familiar with the Adventist Health Study, I'm talking about that issue, and other related research projects are awaiting that are aware that following a healthy Adventist lifestyle can add up to 10 years to one's life. Now that is about health. A young person might be inclined to say, I, I don't care to live 10, years, 10 more years at the end of my life in some nursing home. It turns out that if you eat the healthier diet when you're young, you stay young longer. So the years you add will be healthier years, not just 10 more years at the end in a nursing home. In fact, the amount of time that you are significantly ill at the end is actually shortened. 
There were also apparently some formerly Jewish believers in Rome who were encouraging the Christian believers to adopt the keeping of certain ceremonial Sabbaths. We already read that. At one time, there were quite a number of those ceremonial Sabbaths. Paul placed the keeping of those ceremonial Sabbaths in the same category as eating food offered to idols. I feel that I'm being a bit contrary, but okay, that's fine. Go I'm going to raise a question about yeah. that. Because uh, we, we see this, <laughs> he who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and immediately we think of some type of religious observance of a day. Mm -hmm. And so you have the Sunday keepers say, well, it's talking about the Sabbath, you know, and then we sort of try to buffer that by saying, no, it must be talking about the ceremonial Sabbaths. But if you look at the parallel expression, um, he who eats does so to, for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. So is that talking about communion? Is the, what other religious observance of a, oh, a well, meal would there be? Well, to, to the Jews, there were many. Well, and, and that's, the, that's the issue here, because on one side are those people who still think we probably need to do all those Jewish things. And, and if, you go back to, if you go back to Leviticus, there are a lot of them. Yeah. But these are things that were different opinions. You mm -hmm. had some people who said this, and Paul seems to be saying, that's okay. Either you can, this person can believe this, and this person can believe that. If really, you want. Right. Yeah. If you but want to follow, you, what you're saying is if you, if you are a Jew and you have convictions about these ceremonial Sabbaths and you want to observe them, that should be fine. No one else should condemn you for it. And on the other hand, you shouldn't condemn them for not observing the ceremonial Sabbaths. Yeah, I, I think it's talking about secular things, not religious things. Was there such a thing as secular things back then? Or Earth. even today. Is there well, a difference between secular and well, religious? Well, there is today because we got science and the physical stuff. But, that's man but back then, I think, I think religion just permeated through everything. Yeah. Perhaps. But maybe some felt that uh, celebrating the, the birthday of this decaying dust that's destined for death was not worthy. Perhaps others felt that, that was, they could do it unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Maybe their now, the, fact, the day of their baptism was more important, and we should celebrate that or some such yeah. thing. The fact that they're called Sabbaths suggests that they came from the Jewish tradition. What Sabbaths? The ceremonial Sabbaths. Well, I know, but it doesn't mention Sabbath in here. Well, uh, those days. Yeah. It just says one esteems one day over another, yeah. another. There might have been day pagan life. days, too, he could have been talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's what he's talking so, about. Well, you know. yeah, you know, if the emperor had a birthday, uh, yeah, you know, okay, and we're supposed to honor the emperor, some would say, I, you know, I'm thankful that we have this Roman peace that we can get around. Mm -hmm. and but he said it so general, it was probably covering everybody. Yeah, so. I mean, you could apply it in a lot of ways. I'm just yeah. trying to mm -hmm. say there's another possible interpretation yeah. of this than what we normally... Yeah. Well, and if we go back to Galatians chapter 2, the problem there was, here were all these Gentiles who had become Christians, and Peter ate with them for a while, but when the people from Jerusalem showed up, people, Peter said, oh, no, I don't think I better, and then Barnabas said, oh, no, I better not, and then the others said, oh, no, I better not. So clearly there was, a, there was an issue about whether it's all right to eat with a Gentile sitting next to you in, in church. That, that's very clear. So that's one possibility, and there are other, other possibilities. Um, Paul went on to say that those who had a judgmental attitude, one and from either side of the argument, are condemning their opponents, are destroying the very peace and harmony God intended for Christian churches. I mean, they were, they were liable of being killed for being Christians. They didn't need... I mean, that's a, it's bad enough when you're outside. There's no, I mean, you don't want to have conflicts even inside the church. So, what happens even in our modern days when churches choose up sides and begin accusing, throwing darts, at, verbal darts at each other? Well, they how many it all of us over the internet? <laughs> and how many of us have heard uh, of churches that got torn apart? Yes. <clears throat>
Today it might be over what kind of music is all right to play in church, what kind of dresses the women should wear. I mean, take your choice. Now you've gone to meddling. Yeah. Well, those are not core issues, we're going to say. Mm. Honestly, now, considering the full span of history, especially since early Christian times, is it the Seventh-day Sabbath or the ceremonial Sabbaths that have created the most controversy? Seventh day. No question about that. Mm -hmm. Through the history of our world, far more controversy has arisen over the Seventh-day Sabbath than over the ceremonial Sabbath. Why is that? Well, Satan understands very well that a correct understanding, and this is not just whether you're keeping it from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown, but a real correct understanding of what that observance really means um, will, lead, will lead people to honor and admire our true Creator and God. <coughs> That is far bigger issue than any involving a ceremonial Sabbath, and Satan knows it. He will do anything to prevent our correct worship on God's holy day. So, does that mean then that we are free to condemn those who do not observe the Sabbath, even the Seventh-day Sabbath, just the way we do? No. He was pretty, pretty adamant about that in Romans 2, wasn't he? Right, and... Uh I am going to suggest that in Colossians, where it says, there, therefore, uh, let no one act a, as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, yeah. which are a shadow, that it's not so much talking about uh, whether you observe a day or whatever, yeah. but how you do it. Well, I think it goes beyond that. Observing a day has no place. It's observing God on that day that really should be emphasized. And I think for the meat, the same thing is somewhat true. It's not a matter of the meat being a problem. It's a matter of how we consider right. the food. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it do to you? Are we doing everything to the glory of God? Which, what is the glory of God? It's His humility. It's His love. It's His mercy. And if what we eat reflects that humility, love, and mercy, we are on God's side. Very good. So, would you say, let's, let's do a little hypothesizing here, would you say, if you eat a carrot and you think that means that you are worshiping the carrot God, that would be wrong? Yeah, you need some yeah, education. What think. <laughs> well, what if I ate a carrot and somebody else thought it was the carrot God and it was wrong? Well, Paul made his comments about that, didn't he? Better not eat carrots. Yeah. Well, I hope I don't starve, depending on the people that are around me. Okay, well, it never helps to beat people over the head with one's arguments. That would just drive them away, and, you know, you cannot antagonize and persuade at the same time. So if, we're trying, if our job is trying to bring people into the church and trying to convince them that we have the right approach to all aspects of life, we can't be antagonizing them and persuading them at the same time. Well, we, it's pretty obvious from scientific studies that vegetarianism is a, dis, a high, healthier lifestyle for most of us. It should not become a matter of condemnation either. Remember that Abraham and Sarah fed beef to whom? The Lord and, the Lord and two angels. Genesis 18. Did they refuse to eat it? Did God ask for a second helping? We don't know that latter part. <laughs> I'm just asking. I'm asking you to speculate here. Well, I know what you would say. You do know what I say. I would yeah, say. I, I would. I would venture a guess and probably get it right. That was wonderful. <laughs> as far food, as the second Sarah. second helping goes. Well, we know for <laughs> sure that Jesus fed thousands of people fish. Matthew fourteen thirteen to twenty one and Matthew fifteen thirty two to thirty eight on two different occasions, Jesus even created fish for his disciples to eat out of the thin air. John twenty one nine. Or should we say, as one student did one time when asked, why do you think Jesus fed the disciples fish on the beach? He replied, I understand, uh, I understand that he was living up to all the light he had. I hope that uh, makes everybody smile. Well, I hope he was the light. <laughs> not, not. But he also, he also ate fish after his resurrection. He came. Uh, yep, they gave him he, some fish he and he ate to them and he, he, they gave him some fish and he ate it. Christ never worked a miracle. I'm quoting now from, this would be um, 
Zarve just page 366, the first paragraph. Christ never worked a miracle except to supply a genuine necessity. And every miracle was of a character to lead the people to the tree of life, whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. The simple food passed around by the hands of the disciples, that is the, the, the loaves and the fishes, uh, were, contained a whole treasure of lessons. It was humble fare that had been provided. The fishes and barley loaves were the daily food of the fisher folk about the Sea of Galilee. So Christ could have spread before the people a rich repast, but food prepared merely for the gratification of appetite would have conveyed no lesson for their good. Christ taught them in this lesson that, uh, that the natural provisions of God for man had been perverted. And never did people enjoy the luxurious feast prepared for the gratification of perverted taste as this people enjoyed the rest and the simple food which Christ provided so far from human habitation. Do you think that uh, those fish and those barley loaves he fed them were extra tasty? By the way, was this food, was this fish cooked or not cooked? Probably cooked. Depends. You have to look at the, the sack, the beginning <laughs> sack, right? Because whatever was in there got duplicated. I see. So. <laughs> well, did they eat fish that was raw, or did they typically... Well, there are people in some parts of the world who definitely eat fish that and was raw. And how did they get it long distances without it spoiling? Did they dry it and smoke it? Or? Well, you're talking about the people in Jesus' day? Yeah. We don't know. I keep them in buckets of water and keep them alive. That's what they did with a lot of well, a lot of meat. <laughs> a lot of meat, though, oh, they keep it alive, hanging like some of the chickens and stuff. You know, They're maybe they kept it in a nice chest. <laughs> nice chest. <laughs> okay. I don't think so. <laughs> so does all of this mean that our message on diet is not important? Of course not. As usual, we must interpret everything we read in the Bible in the context in which it was written. The question here is, how can former pagans worship and eat together with former Jews without getting upset by each other's behavior, and especially when the people come visiting from Jerusalem, right? Well, in Romans 14, the last few verses, I'm going to jump down to verses 22 and 23, there's some very interesting words. Keep what you believe about this matter, then, between yourself and God. Happy are those who do not feel guilty when they do something they judge is right. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them while they eat it, because their action is not based on faith, and anything that is not based on faith is sin. What does that mean? Anything that's not based on the persuasion of Jesus, which, as we just said a little while ago, is that humility, that love, and that mercy, then it becomes wrong. If we lack humility, love, and mercy in our interaction with others, regardless of what the topic is, there's something wrong with it. And yeah. if we're doing it for our self-righteous appearance, it's just as evil as if we had done it. Yeah. Well, we are traditionally read, we have traditionally read 1 John 3, 4 as a, as a definition of sin, which says, sin is the transgression of law. That's in, of course, the King James. More correctly, it should really be translated, sin is lawlessness. Hamartia stin anomia is what it says literally in the Greek. James 4, 17 says, so then if you do not do the good we know we should do, if we do not do the good we know we should do, we are guilty of sin. So is there any limit to the good we know we should do? But in Romans 14, 23, we read, anything that is not based on faith is sin. What does that imply? Well, if faith is a relationship with God that helps us to become more like Him on a daily basis because by beholding we become changed, then sin would be anything that separates us from God. And of course, that's what it says in Isaiah 59, verse 2. So coming nearer to God is faith. Going away from God is sin. Sin and faith are opposites. Okay? Well, um, of course the devil would like us to exercise our selfishness and exercise our sinfulness and follow his example. If we claim to be Christians, we need to orient our lives to the standards that we have been given by God. 
Our lives are to be based on principle. Now we've been talking about principle a lot here today, even though we may not have called it that. What are the principles that guide us in who we sit next to our in church, sit next to in church, what we eat in the restaurant? What are the principles? Well, glory to God and love for one another. Yeah. Anything that breaks those things apart yeah. leaves us back where we started from. We don't have time to go to, into this in depth, but in the next chapter, Romans 15, Paul immediately says, okay, you people who think you're strong in the faith, good for you. Don't be the cause of causing some weaker, younger, newer Christian to fall, okay? And that really is sort of the conclusion to Romans 14, isn't it? Then he talks about, he summarizes what he said in the whole book of Romans, in Romans 15, 15 17, 7 through 13, and um, points out very clearly, even using quoting passages from the Old Testament, that the gospel is for whom? Everyone. Everyone. No one is to be left out. He quotes straight from the Old Testament. Paul was not apologizing for speaking so boldly about what he believed. He had set as a goal for himself to preach the gospel in places where no one had done so before. And then he goes on to talk about something that unfortunately never happened. His plan to get to Rome, to meet with the, with the church there, be helped by them to go on to Spain and spread the gospel in Spain. But of course we know that he went down to Jerusalem and was arrested and finally ended up getting, getting to Rome. But under what circumstances? Prisoner. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Some people have asked the question about how Paul could have known so many people in, in Rome if he had never been there. And these were probably people who had known Paul somewhere else and then moved there. Um, Romans 16, verses 16 says, Greet one another with the kiss of peace. Do we do that? No. Well, we need to think about the cultural context again. What? hard handshake or a kiss in some areas or hugs in other areas of the world are, ex are accepted. And then Romans 16, 22 says, I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, send you Christian greetings. Tertius was just the secretary for Paul. He didn't actually, he did the, the manual writing, but we come now to the end for this wonderful book of Romans. I hope you've enjoyed it. Our kind and wonderful Father, we end with a bang, we end with a, some very important attempts to apply the principles that Paul is trying to preach. We thank you for this book, which has so many thought-provoking and challenging ideas in it. We thank you for this privilege we've had over the last 13 weeks to study these chapters and, and what all it might have meant to the people in Paul's day. We look forward to the time when we will be able to ask them ourselves personally, you know, you were a member of the church in Rome. What did you think the first time you heard this book? And so forth. May that time come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.